on behalf of the Bank of Springfield, we welcome you and we hope that you'll find the next hour on the Secure 2.0, a very informative and helpful time of learning. We've got three distinguished professionals in the field of law, taxation, and retirement plan and, and, re, and retirement distributions expertise. But before I, I uh, uh, will introduce them, I'd like to just kind of tee up the topic and the format we're going to use this afternoon. So it's a one hour session, and I know that each one of our experts could spend a whole hour on one or two of these topics. It's going to be a myriad of points that we may not be able to cover. But please jot the questions down, and for our online audience, feel free to send those questions to us through chat, and we'll get those questions to our experts, and you'll get the answers you need eventually. Also, we're going to have additional seminars, so you know we could have an act, we could have a Secure Act 2.1 or a 2.2 if we need to. So we're going to have lots of opportunities for continued learning. The panelists have been kind enough to say that they can stay a little bit afterwards, and that'll be good for, for us to be able to ask questions, but feel free to contact them individually, of course, for your customized answers to your situations. Let's jump right into just a quick overview of what we're looking at today. It was the midnight hour of the last few business days of 2022. Congress passed, the president signed the omnibus a spending bill. I mean, this was like a mega $1.7 trillion bill, 4,100 pages, and embedded in that is the SECURE Act 2.0. Now, that was also based on the SECURE Act of 2019, and SECURE, the, ac the ac acronym stands for Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement. Bottom line, they say it's designed for us to improve retirement readiness. So let's get into it. We're privileged to have three of the top experts in the fields of law and uh, in taxation and in retirement plan expertise. Our first presenter, Drew Long, is CPA and partner at Sickage LLP. He has over 20 years of experience helping both individuals and businesses with great tax savings ideas. And something I didn't know about you, Drew, is that you are the president of Secretary of the State Planning Council. That's great. It's impressive. Our second presenter will be attorney Hugh Drake. And Hugh is partner at the Brown Hay and Stevens firm. He's been there over 25 years, and he is a frequent lecturer, numerous articles, and including he's been quoted at the Wall Street Journal. That's impressive, Hugh. You got a copy. <laughs> Last but not least is Don Weinhoff, CPA and third party administrator at Quorum Consulting. He has been in public accounting for over 20 years and third party administration for 28 years. Uh, he is the founding partner of Quorum and he's our expert on everything retirement plans. So 401k, 403b, 457, SEP simples. So if you're a business owner here today, and you're thinking about starting a plan or maybe amending your plan, Don's a great expert to have here with us. Let's jump right into Drew Long's presentation. Drew, there's a, a myriad of, of ideas that you could launch into. Uh, one of the most impactful ones for us, if you look at it from a tax viewpoint. Sure, and I'm happy to go through it. And uh, so, first of all, thanks for having me on this call. It's a uh, it's an honor to be asked. I know that uh, there's a lot of things that are in this bill um, that, that came through and kind of as you take a step back and you look at everything that, that uh, got passed during that time, I think it's refreshing to know that it, the federal government at least recognized kind of the demographics of what we're experiencing in our population where we have um, kind of a combination of, of an aging workforce, um, many of which maybe haven't saved like they should have during retirement. And we also have a lot of young people coming in and um, who don't necessarily have, you know, yet be aware of all to save as much as maybe previous generations did. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting that a lot of the barriers that were put in place, um, you know, and a lot of the restrictive rules as far as uh, withdrawing some things from plans and, and, and setting up new retirement plans for employees, a lot of those have kind of been loosened a little bit now. Everything's 
not completely free, but it, it's nice to know that that things are moving in the right direction from that aspect. So I'm going to go through just a few slides of things that I picked out uh, up here that I thought would be uh, informational to you. Kind of my goal, I kind of communicated earlier, is just to uh, give you some info, maybe some things that can kind of spur some questions for you. If you pick one or two things out of this that you find valuable, then we did it, we did our jobs. So, so um, I'm just going to kind of get right into it here. And a lot of these you will find uh, are kind of random, you know, kind of all over the board, but they're all, most of them are good. So, um, the first thing is the Small Employer Pension Plan Startup Credit. Uh, this is a credit that has been around for quite some time, um, but it does increase the credit. So if you're a small employer and you're starting a brand new plan for the first time, um, you used to be able to have a credit for up to 50% of your startup costs uh, in order to set up that plan. That's now been increased to 100% for these employers, which is a very positive thing. Um, and on top of that, um, there's an, an additional incentive for employer contributions as well. So if, you get, if you're giving any kind of employer contribution to the plan, um, you can it gets capped up to, uh, I think it's a thousand bucks per employee and, um, and it phases out, it starts phasing out, I think after 50, 50 employees. So that's something that's starting right up. And I think this is a kind of one of these things is, as we think about Illinois too, and I am going to jump around a little bit, uh, starting in November, I think many of you might be aware that there's the Illinois uh, Secure Choice Act, I think is the name of that. And uh, many uh, business owners in the state of Illinois, if they have uh, over five employees, are going to be forced either to provide a plan, okay, for, for, their, uh, for their employees, or they'll be uh, forced to participate in a state funded plan, not a state funded plan, but at least in the state administrative plan. So um, a lot of uh, the people that I work for, I think it's almost unanimous that they would rather have their own plan and administer it themselves than to leave it to the hands of the state. So um, when you think of these kind of credits and these kind of things, um, kind of keep that in mind too, because that's uh, kind of in the background here. Okay. But that's good. It's an increase in the credit that uh, was already in place, but it's better now. Um, Another one is the Sabres match. I remember this. Um, this kind of this applies to a lot of our younger um, younger professionals. Um, and you see this the most there. Um, but this credit's always been in place, at least during my career. But if you have income, married, filing, joint, that at the top side are around seventy thousand dollars. If you're single, it tops out in the forties. But if you give to a retirement plan at these levels, you're able to have credit. Okay, uh, against your income tax bill, non-refundable, meaning that you don't get a refund for it, but it does make your taxes lower. Um, that has always been in place, and the incentive was to incentivize increased savings in a retirement plan, right? But if you kind of take a step back and think about it, like they, they give you the credit, but then you get a big refund, and what do most people do with their big refunds? They, they spend it, right? They buy big screen TVs and cars. And, Whatever the, whatever the heck else they want to do with it. So um, one change that they didn't make to kind of tie the loop on that is uh, uh, instead of getting the credit, the IRS will be putting together a plan. Uh, it looks like it starts in 2027, so anything after 2026, where that money from that credit will go straight to a retirement account okay, rather than being part of a, uh, an increased refund. But that's uh, a change to the savers match. Not immediate, but there. Um, probably the biggest one right now for most people is the R&D change. Um, up to only a couple years ago, the R&D was set at 70 and a half. And I think this is just a recognition that uh, you know people are working later into their lives than before. Uh, you know, we went up to 72 uh, a couple years ago, and now we're going up to 73. Um, by 2033, it's going to be 75. Okay, so. It's just going to keep on going up and up. I think I don't see a trend going the opposite direction, right? So um, that's a very good planning tool. If you're still working or you don't need to be taking that money out, especially if the market's not where you want it to be, uh, to have that free. Okay. Um, other catch-up limits. Uh, this is really good in my opinion. A lot of times the IRS makes the mistake of setting limits on things and not indexing them for inflation. Okay. And I think everyone knows. Um, where we're sitting uh, between six and 10% inflation, you know, over the last few years. And we've got these IRS limits that have been put in place that are from the early 2000s and sometimes much older, right? So it becomes a restrictive thing for a lot of us when we have these limits that we have on things like catch up contributions. So um, just know that they're now indexed for inflation. So every year our, our catch up contributions into our plans are going to go up. Um, 
not only are they going to go up in the future, they're going up now. Uh, it, it's gone up to $7,500 in 2023, and I think in your early 60s, that goes up to $10,000. Okay, so it's a lot of increased uh, opportunity for you to get a lot of money into your retirement plan in a hurry if you need to do it. This one was really interesting to me. Um, that's why it's in there, I guess. But uh, catch up contributions tree or does it rot? Uh, anytime, and I guess I get, I kind of think of the politics of things and I, I find it entertaining. But uh, anytime when uh, a bill is passed, someone has to be looking at the budget, right? And believe it or not, the budget I don't know if necessarily balances, but the budget, budget does need to be taken care of. So um, when you start increasing catch up contributions and things like that, um, you also got to realize that with that comes larger deductions with, and with that comes decreased revenue for the federal government. So they put a limit on that. So if you make over, if you make over 145 a year, your catch up contributions will automatically be considered as more off contributions, which I guess depends on what your perspective is on things. I mean, uh, you don't get the deduction now, but when you retire at 73, I guess it would be now, if you're all retiring at 73, then you don't have to pay tax when you take it out. So. It's kind of neat, neat little wrinkle into that into that book. Another interesting thing um, is I know that right now the Roth 401k option is a, a very interesting uh, thing that most companies are starting to put into place, at least the ones I'm seeing. I've experienced it myself, right? Um, we have, if you choose to have a Roth 401k and, and your employer matches that before this year, you'd have a You'd have a statement and it'd come and you'd have your Roth 401k balance and then you'd have a, a, a pre-tax balance of all your employer contributions that are sitting in a different bucket. And before this year, then you know, when that would be taken out upon retirement, you'd have a portion that wouldn't be taxed. And then the portion that went into that, you know, the traditional 401k amount that was the, the employer contribution would come out and be taxed to you. Well, now you have the uh, ability to uh, elect to have that be a Roth which is a very good uh, I don't know Don, if you're going to be expanding that sorry but step, step <laughs> um, this is just re related to federally declared disasters but I did want to kind of bring this up um, um, the, the IRS is putting into place a lot of quite a few more exceptions to the rule when it comes to withdrawing funds from a retirement camp account that would normally be subject to taxation and or penalty okay so um you know generally speaking if you're not retirement age and you aren't taking a loan from your qualified plan then it's going to be taxed to you and in most cases you're going to be paying not only the tax but a 10 percent penalty on that um it, but in the case of a federally declared disaster um, if you're in that flow, you can take out up to $22,000 early um, if you're in a pinch. But you just got to realize that for any of these rules that you have kind of have to be in a pinch because you have to pay it back over a three year period. So if you take out the money and then three years later, you don't have the money anymore, then you're taxed on it. So um, be aware of that. There are others, I don't know if you remember during the pandemic, there was the ability to do a similar thing. Don, was it a was it a larger amount of time? So, maybe you know, yeah, it, was, years. It, was just, it was the same concept over three years. Right. And, I, and I'm sure you had, just like we had people come up at year three and say, right, I owe money. Why Why do I owe money? Well, you, you expanded it over three years. Right. To, to defer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So that, I think that might have been the start of that a little bit, but, uh, but you can do it in federally declared disasters. It goes on to say if you have qualified education costs, um, you know, if you have a life changing event, such as a terminal illness, um, a real interesting 1 that came out that is also, if you're in a uh, abusive relationship, you can escape that. You can actually use similar types of uh, scenarios to remove money from your, from your account and then, uh, have, have to pay it back over 3 years, but you know, it's good to have an emergency. So if you have, uh, yourself, something similar, or, uh, Someone you're working with needs the money in, in the worst way. If, if there's there's more avenues to 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 ex access that liquidity if they need to. So I did want to. It's not all about federally declared disasters. It's just a concept that there are more, more reasons that you can take it out. Um, the simple to safe harbor. Now this one um, I think Don might be seeing quite a bit. Um, 
But you know what I've experienced with that Security Choice Act that's coming out are a lot of people that they got to put something into place. So many people are choosing the simple IRA just because it's, it's simple. You know, you, you just set it up. Um, but it's all nice to know that you can change that into either a simple 401k, I think a four, like a safe harbor or any other kind of plan, and you can do it at any time. You don't necessarily have to meet some sort of deadline in order for it to, to work. So the IRS has given us a lot of freedom you know, for our employers to take care of our people uh, and, and take care of themselves, really. And then uh, the employers can actually match contributions for student loan repayments, which is kind of a nice little, little add-on. But one of the good ones that I think, which is a real nice thing, is for 529 college savings plans. Um, now, if you've got a 529 and, and you plan on using it for school, but say you don't need to, say you've got a kid that uh, um, is just really smart, gets, an, gets a scholarship, potentially doesn't go to school all four years or, or any reason whatsoever, but you've got this extra money sitting in a 529 account that you plan on using, but you didn't end up using. Um, based on last year's rules, you've got a scenario to where you got, if you take it out, you're subject to tax on it and a penalty because you're not using that money for qualified tuition costs. Um, the IRS has helped us out there. Um, so over the course of their lifetime, you can you can actually roll over into a Roth IRA up to the, the maximum limit, um, up to $35,000 a year into an IRA. So um, I think it's pretty clear, you know, if you're a young man or woman and you have a Roth IRA set up and you have that start, you know, the time value of money, it's just, it's, it's kind of a kind of timeless thing. It's perfect because, you know, you don't pay tax on it and you don't pay tax, don't pay tax on it. So it's a it's a good perk. I think it's really great for families that maybe have concerns with you know, some 529s that they just don't know what to do with. Um, the only caveat to that is that it's got to be a 15 year old plan. So you can't just set up a 529 and start rolling it over, which would, would be nice. You know? yeah. Yeah. And you yeah. probably see. I mean, we we see a lot of clients that the 529s are just so easy for annual exclusion gifting that that. They're they're just maxing those out, and so they'll end up with a half a million dollar five twenty nine plan. And you know, if the kids don't go on to to uh, uh, if they're smart, and they don't go on to law school, for instance. <laughs> then you know, uh, they have you know they have three four hundred thousand dollars, and they're looking for family members who might want to go out or they'll go back and, and retire. <laughs> You know, get a master's degree in creative writing or something because they've got all this money sitting out there. And this is a, an option to uh, take it in back to the sport. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see it do a little bit. <laughs> yeah, the 35,000. Yeah, I'll just get tired. But maybe it will over time. <laughs> and then, really, the last. Uh, Last slide that I have is uh, for a qualified charitable distribution. It's now qualified charitable distributions are in the that's still very valuable. Uh, if you've got a uh, and you're at, as of retirement age and uh, you don't necessarily need the funds, right? Or maybe you just have a charitable intent, you can give up to a hundred thousand dollars directly to to a qualified charity. Um, now this is it's not a deduction, but it's better than a deduction because with it there could be limitations on the amount you can deduct per year. Um, things might need to be carried forward based on your income. But in this case, the money comes straight out of your IRA and goes straight to the charity. And the, the real tax impact is just not taxed. You take it out. Okay. Um, that's now index for inflation. I don't know how old the hundred thousand dollars is, but I, I don't remember any different number personally. In 2006, maybe. Was it? Yeah. Okay. So that'd be right when I started to do it. So, yeah. yeah. So, so that's now index for inflation. So if we're at 8%, then you know, that starts adding up pretty quick. Yeah. Okay. So, and another real neat one I think that you might see a lot of is that uh, you can also make a $50,000 distribution straight for like a threat, a charitable remainder unit trust, or something similar um, if you want to use that as an estate plan and tool. Okay. So a lot of cool stuff. It's not all of it. And especially with the 529 Roth, anybody excited about that? Yeah. <laughs> We've got room for a question or two. 
Yeah, um, so Carla online said, with all the emphasis on the Roth opportunities and thinking of converting the original IRA to a Roth IRA, do so? Um, well, I think it depends on a couple of things. Um, it depends on your uh, your age and what your expected rate of return is and life expectancy. I think that if you talk to your financial planner, the financial planner will do what's called a, uh, a break-even analysis for that. And what that means is that if you roll it over to a Roth, you're taxed on money. And depending on your, say you're in the 24% bracket, well, you've, you've just cut into that 24%. So how long does it take for you to throw that money back to the 24 that you lost by rolling it over and then seeing if you if, if you can do it. And also, you gotta also figure out how you can really use it, you know, because it can be becoming a great wealth transfer tool as well. So if you never plan on using it during your life, it becomes a little bit more of an easy decision. Hope that answers this question. Yeah. Any others for Drew? Uh -huh, that's all we had right now. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move over to uh, Hugh. And Hugh Drake, uh, with his expertise on the law, the aspects of the Secure Act 2.0 that he's looked at as being the most impactful, yeah. in Q, in, includes a piggybacking on the QCD. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's the only reason I knew it was 2006, because it was in black supply. But very smart for executive yeah, in 2006. Um, so the uh, yeah, just to expand a little bit on on the uh, uh, IRAs and charity, you know, if you're charitably inclined, that's always the starting point. If you're charitably inclined, because these opportunities, um, you, you know, they're not going to save you a whole lot. Um, I mean, this is not a play for personal savings. This is a better way of contributing to charity. IRAs have always been. A, a great asset for contributions to charity with all of the built in income tax consequences, which are not a concern for the charities. It's like, um, uh, like farm ground, like low basis farm ground, great asset for contributing to a charity because the charity is not worried about the capital gains. So there are better and worse assets, um, uh, when you're talking about charitable gifts. And so this gives us a little more. Um, benefit on uh, the one time 100,000 and, you know, with it being indexed for inflation these days, uh, that's no joke, you know, so that's uh, that's going to go up dramatically. Um, now, the, the one time contribution of up to $50,000 to a charitable remainder trust or a charitable gift annuity, you know, if you were not otherwise going to incorporate a charitable remainder trust into your estate planning. And, and what is a charitable remainder trust? So it's what we refer to in a category of trust called split interest trust, where basically, you know, there's an income interest and then there's a remainder interest. And in this case, charitable remainder, there are also charitable leads, but charitable remainder is where the income goes to a particular place to an individual typically for life, and then the remainder goes to the charity. So when, when the gift is made, as far as gift taxes are concerned, you're not dinged for the entire value of the asset that is being gifted because you can take a deduction for that remainder interest. So that's where the split interest reference comes to. You know, you put a value on the, the lifetime income interest and a value on the remainder interest, and then you still get some uh, some charitable deduction while perhaps providing income to an individual for life that, you know, may need some additional support. Uh, farm ground is, is really good for, for charitable remainder trust because, you know, you're, you're, there are a lot of different flavors of these things, too. You can do unit trust, you can do straight income. Um, uh, so, uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's fairly expensive to set these up. And so if you were only doing a one time $50,000 gift into a charitable remainder trust, it, that might be overkill, but charitable gift annuities, those don't cost anything. Major public charities, um, will, will help facilitate those. And there are no really no transactional costs for you. So so those I could see uh, really getting a lot more use uh, than perhaps you know uh, opportunities created for this fifty thousand and 
charitable remainder trust. You know, one one other thing worth mentioning too is this hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, that's only public charities. It's not donor advised funds. I I, I love donor advised funds. Donor advised funds are great for those that are charitably inclined because. You know, you can stay involved in, in uh, how those distributions are made over time, you know, well after the point at which you make the contribution to the fund. Uh, but donor advice funds are not included in, in this opportunity. Um, Hugh, I ask, does that mean that you could do a donor advice fund in addition to it? <laughs> sure, exactly right. Yeah, and you know, and. It, a lot of times, with, you know, with with those that are charitably charitably inclined, you're going to have a number of different charitable avenues that you're making contributions through. So, and and it's something as advisors, I think it's overlooked a lot. Is you know, on your death, you know, do you want to include charities? You know, individuals may be making gifts to charities on a regular basis throughout their life, but if the advisor doesn't say, do you want some portion of your estate to go to a charity? One fashion or another, when you pass, they may just not even think about. It. In my work with you know, people that have value-based goals, a lot of times I'll, I'll just ask them, "So, what are your hobbies and interests?" Yeah. Because if I use the word charity, sometimes there's a, an emotional barrier. But right. Hey, if he's a hunter, he probably ducks unlimited. Anything about science, medicine, agricultural, uh, you know, medical, any of that, religious, of course, and any of that be a Great addition to a, to a good financial plan, good. Yeah. yeah. And you start the conversation and then you see them get excited, you know, and that's the best feeling, obviously. Um, so, so also in the case of, um, uh, let's, let's jump forward a second. So, so you, we basically, in terms of beneficiaries, We've got designated beneficiaries, eligible designated beneficiaries, and then not designated beneficiaries. I mean, those are kind of the three big categories. Uh, you want to stay within the first two, right? You don't want to be uh, dealing with not designated beneficiaries. And when it comes to trusts, uh, there it's, it becomes a trust as beneficiaries of qualified retirement. It gets really tricky to be a designated beneficiary and what is more to be an eligible designated beneficiary. And so one of the one of the new elements in front of, in terms of charitable options is that um, and, oh, and the distinction I should say too between designated beneficiary and eligible designated beneficiary is that you have to pay out within 10 years as a designated beneficiary. But you can go beyond the 10 years to be an eligible designated beneficiary. Okay, say that 10 years, guys. So, um, um, with beneficiaries of special needs trusts, um, those beneficiaries being disabled or chronically ill, uh, they're exempt from the 10 year rule as long as all the other beneficiaries of the special needs trust. Are qualified beneficiaries for RMD purposes, and where that posed a problem a lot of times with people with uh, uh, children with special needs is they would want to provide for the remainder interest of the trust to go to the charitable organization that was providing the care for their child, but but that would that would blow the ability of this uh, using the the child's lifespan as the payout. Um, you would be limited to this 10 year window for payouts. Well, that's not the case now. Now you can name a beneficiary, but name a charity as a remainder beneficiary of a special needs trust and still use the child's life expectancy for the payout um, through the special needs trust. And um, this kind of requires a little bit of context in terms of trust as beneficiary. So I, I mentioned how, how difficult uh, it can be, and which is why a lot of times we really just try to avoid trust as beneficiaries of qualified retirement, and, except in a few instances where it's really unavoidable. So this kind of shows um, 
you know, if between spouse one and spouse two, if spouse two passes first, so this chart is basically being read right to left. If the first spouse to pass leaves everything out right to the surviving spouse, you, you, you lose the ability to use the state tax exception of the first spouse to pass because everything is under the marital deduction. So basically then the surviving spouse only has one estate tax exemption, at least an Illinois estate tax exemption, to pass their assets down to the next generation. So if collectively, my husband and wife, if their estates are over 4 million collectively, then you really have to employ these trusts that are created trust A and trust B, and they're all a lot of different flavors of these types of trusts, but credit shelter and marital trusts where you park the assets of the first spouse to die for the benefit of the surviving spouse. It uses the exemption of the first spouse to die and doesn't become part of the surviving spouse's taxable estate. And by doing that, we can double estate tax exemption for the amount passing down to the next generation. So for Illinois purposes, we can get up to 8 million. And for federal purposes, at least right now, the federal exemption per individual is almost 13 million. That's going to change in 2026, but right now we can get up to like 26 million almost for federal purposes, as long as we employ the exemptions of both spouses. But generally speaking, if we don't need to rely on the value of qualified retirement to fund these trusts, we just kind of take a parallel track and keep it as simple as possible. You know, the keep it simple, stupid premise is, is just name spouse outright as the primary beneficiary of your retirement plan and name children in equal shares as the contingent beneficiaries. So it kind of runs on a parallel track to your wills and your trusts that you're creating in your estate plan. However, if we see this a lot with physicians, for instance, uh, where 80% of their wealth is in, is in an IRA. And so really you have no choice but to use IRA assets to, to fund these trusts upon the death of the first spouse to make use of the estate tax exception of that deceased spouse. Because otherwise, upon the death of the surviving spouse, you're going to take a, a big tax hit at least on the Illinois side. So if, if a large percentage of the estate is qualified retirement, if, uh, uh, or if you have a special needs child, for instance, that's gonna be a beneficiary of, of qualified retirement, you can't have those assets go out to the, to the child individually without blowing their government assistance because these are means tested uh, programs, you know, SSI, and, and if, if they have, in many cases, more than $2,000 worth of assets, then effectively they're going to get thrown off of, you know, Medicaid and SSI. So, so if you want to supplement those government benefits, the qualified retirement benefits have to go into a trust that will then be available to help supplement government assistance. But, you know, you have to be very, very careful about how those trusts are drafted. And so this isn't a new development with the Secure 2.0, um, but the, the regs, uh, which are fairly new from the Secure Act, basically acknowledge the trusts that are intended to collect and then sometimes distribute qualified retirements. So they refer to those as see-through trusts. And the reason for that is, is because you can see through the trust who all of the potential beneficiaries are. And if those are qualified beneficiaries, um, then you're okay for the trust to be a designated beneficiary. So that gets you to, to the 10 year mark. But if you pay out of the trust, all of the retirement assets that are distributed in the trust get paid out. So whatever the, the R&D is, gets paid out to the beneficiary. It's what's referred to as a conduit trust. So basically, you, you will just ignore the existence of the trust 
and that beneficiary will be treated as the beneficiary for purposes of determining how long the payout is. But the problem is, is you have contingent beneficiaries and contingent remainder beneficiaries of trust. So that's where it becomes very difficult to draft to make sure that you're not, you know, there's no foot fault in terms of a trust being a beneficiary uh, qualified retirement. And uh, so if we can avoid it, if we can keep it simple, that's what we do. But, but where does it uh, really come into play? If you have to use the value of that qualified retirement for purposes of using estate tax exemption, and if you have a special needs child, or if you have, uh, if you have minor children, same thing, because you don't necessarily want those funds all being distributed on to a minor child, or if you have children with uh, drug or alcohol dependency issues, that type of thing. And the potential for the tax consequences, you know, there is always going to be some risk that there's going to be an issue taken with the way the trusts are drafted. And, and perhaps you're going to have more income tax liability as a result of that. But, the, you know, but on balance, protecting a special needs child from losing their government assistance would take priority. Protecting a child from themselves that has drug or alcohol dependency, for instance, or spendthrift issues, that takes precedence. Um, so, so you really, if we try, we strive to try to keep it as simple as possible, keep the qualified retirement on the outside of these trusts, uh, but use them when we have to. Now we know what they meant by sophisticated estate planning. <laughs> And I, I really appreciated you bringing up the Illinois state estate tax. Many of our farmers are not aware. You know, if you've got over three or 400 acres, you're pushing up against that $4 million threshold. And my understanding as is at 4 million, it goes retro back down to dollar one. Is that right? Yeah, effectively it's a trigger. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's not, you're not taxed on the first dollar over 4 million once you hit that mark. Your tax dollar, but ten million uh, could be about a million dollar uh, state tax. State of Illinois state tax. The state. Tax. Well, this has been vital information. You can see already where you want to call these gentlemen and meet with them for one-on-one uh, cons uh, consultations. Thank you, Hugh. Let's move now to everything re retirement plans. Business owners, uh, Don Weinhoff, uh, four decades of experience. <laughs> uh, okay, we're gonna after these guys have told you all the good parts of it. Unfortunately, somebody has to revert back to what's actually going to happen to your retirement plans if you have one. And we're going to uh, focus a little bit here more on what's actually in the act uh, and and what things have to happen. There's a list up there of provisions impacting all employers. And don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of those. But uh, that was some. Uh, initial ideas, but I, I, I will ask you, there are 92 provisions in this act, 92 potential changes to retirement plans, most of which are optional. There are some that are mandatory, some that each of you as a retirement plan, if you have one, will have to address. But I ask you to look at the fifth one now. This got so small, they talked about incentives to participate in a plan for an employer, and it gets down to you as an employer can hand out small gift cards if it will convince someone to participate in the retirement plan. Why that would be important in this, I have no idea, but that's the, that's the lack of level they got to here. So the first one there, uh, we'll go over to the first place, the implementation and deadlines. And this talks about amendments to your retirement plan. If you as a business or someone you know as a business has a retirement plan, you will be required to amend that plan for something. And again, I mentioned that there are 92 different provisions in this plan, okay, but there are a few, uh, probably under 10, that are mandatory to be made, and I believe only two actually for the first year. But you will need to keep, to keep your plan in compliance, you will need to amend your retirement plan for these provisions. So you need to talk with your administrator, your attorney, your CPA, or whomever, and, and get down to that. Now, one of the problems with that is the timing of this amendment. The SECURE Act was part of the Internal Revenue Code's changes to the provisions. Unfortunately, those have been written 
but the the actual regulations, the interpretation of those provisions has not been written yet. So as of right now, uh, the plan went in place or the the code went in place on 1229 of 22. You have to have your plans amended by 1231 of 25. As of right now, there is not a proposed amendment available, even if you wanted to do it, because the IRS hasn't interpreted it enough to be able to write an amendment. So it's great if you want to take care of it. Uh, again, this thing spans over five to seven years of provisions. You can, if there are provisions in the plan that you want to put in place, uh, that you hear about, that you know about, you can put them in place in a good faith interest. Uh, but you do have to remember that by 12, 20, 12 31, 25, you have to have it amended. But again, if you call somebody today, your administrator and say, I'd like to amend my plan now, they won't be able to do that. So keep that in mind. The next one here, the, the eligible automatic enrollment or regulation is probably the, one of the most misunderstood provisions of this plan or of the act. Uh, and basically, it relates to auto enrollment for oral unpaid plans or any plans that accept uh, salary deferrals from your employees. Now, we initially, right after this went into place, we had people calling saying, do I have to start allowing everyone into the plan? No, you do not. You do not. There are some exemptions or exceptions that you'll see here. But as of 12-29-22, if you're going to put a new plan in place, it does have to have an automatic enrollment. What does that mean? You hire an employee today, they go through HR or wherever they are. When they reach their eligibility stage, you talk to them about participating in the plan. That's no longer the case. Once they reach eligibility under the new arrangement, they automatically are signed up for the plan and they have to opt out as opposed to opting in. So what is the automatic enrollment? Uh, the automatic enrollment starts at 3%. So if you have a new employee, he starts, uh, you, you get ready, he reaches his eligibility of a year or whatever your eligibility is in your plan, he, you start deducting 3% from his paycheck. Okay, that continues on. If he doesn't opt out of it, that continues on. Year one, it would be 3%. Year two, it would be 4%. Year three, it would be 5%. Up until you reach uh, and, and that 3% is not mandatory. You can use 3% up to 10%, but until you reach 10 to 15% of their deferral factor. Okay, so this is something they have a, you have an auto enroll and you have an automatic increase each year. If the employee does not want to participate in the plan, they need to sign a form that you will have in your, in your, in your deposit to uh, elect out of the plan. Okay, so they have to elect out both of the automatic enrollment, or if they don't elect out of the automatic enrollment, they have to uh, elect out of the automatic exclamation clause uh, so that it doesn't uh, affect you each year. Now, in some cases, you're going to have people who, you know, are going to get 45 days down the road, 60 days down the road, and say, hey, wait a minute, what's this coming out of my paycheck? I don't understand what this is. Oh, that's the automatic enrollment. I didn't want to do that. Well, as it shows up there um, in, in well, part of that screen, but anyway, there was a, there are permissible withdrawals up to 90 days. If they come in within the first 90 days, they can take their money back out of the plan with no effect. Now, obviously, you as HR people or whatever have some W-2 issues at this point in time, but they have the right to take their money back out of the plan. If they invest in the plan and you know, again, they don't know what's going on and you're taking their money out. What do you do with their money if they haven't elected an investment to put it in and you have to use their QDIA fall by default investment alternative, which all investment plans, all retirement plans have today. If a person doesn't elect where they want their money, you have uh, a default investment that it goes into and your brokers can help you with those many times. Uh, those are based on it used to be used to be able to do that on a uh, money market type situation. Now you have to have it in some type of a secure investment. Okay, so then on to the next section, we look at the exceptions. There are obviously exceptions to this. 
Current plans that are in place prior to 12, 29, 22 are exempted. Don't worry about it. It's, it's not true. You don't have to start enrolling people. If you're a new small business and you're under 10 employees, 10 employees or less, you don't have to use automatic enrollment. If you're a new business, you don't have to use it. There are other provisions in here uh, for new businesses. So there are some, some outs. I will caution you on one thing. One of the new things going on in the retirement plan business are what's called, what are called MEPs, multiple employer plans. And a multiple employer plan uh, would be a situation where uh, someone adopts a retirement plan and they are accepting people yeah. to participate in that plan because of the benefit of you don't have to have your own document, you don't have to produce your own 5500. Uh, so multiple employer plans are, 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 the, are the new hot thing. You don't have to be related entities. I caution you that the IRS has said, even if you've had a plan for 10 years and you now want to join a MEP, which is sponsored, let's say, by the Bank of Springfield, uh, that becomes a new plan and now your automatic enrollment kicks in. So be careful there. There are some catches there. The and, and the one little bit of confusing thing, the last two bottom lines there, um, this automatic enrollment goes into effect effective with all plans that will be written after 12 29 22, the date it was signed. But you don't actually have to start auto uh, withholding until after 12-31-24. Makes no sense. What are you gonna do in that interim period? Well, you're gonna function as an office, but, but that's the way the current uh, legislation is written. The next one here is a provision in the plan that could catch some people. And this actually, it's called the long-term part-time employee provision. And this actually came into being with the original SECURE Act in 2019. Uh, as most of you probably know, uh, in your plan, you, you have an eligibility point. You have to have 1,000 hours. You have to have one year of service, whatever you might have to have to, to become eligible into the plan. And as we've advised people for years, okay, you have 1,000 hours, uh, you got a bunch of part-time people, better cut them off at 999, otherwise they're gonna become eligible for the plan. The IRS has said, no, I can't do that any longer. Now, if you have part long-term part-time employees and they have 500 hours or more for two years in a row, they automatically become eligible to participate in the plan. Uh, so that um, is one that kind of catches some people. Uh, we're not necessarily talking about seasonal people or anybody else, but people that have part-time employees who, uh, for whatever reason, you know, maybe work 700, 800, 900 hours during the year. Uh, starting in 2000, after the years, beginning after 12, 31, 24, if you have part-time employees, 500 hours or more a year for two consecutive years, they become eligible to defer into the plan. Now, that does not mean they have to get an employer match or a profit sharing contract. Okay, you can still set those provisions within the plan. Still need a thousand hours, last day clause, whatever it might be to get a profit sharing contribution or an employer match. Uh, but they do have to be allowed to defer into the plan at that point in time. The other question, which really hasn't been specified totally, but the question is, well, what happened vesting-wise? What if you have a vesting schedule on your match or your profit sharing? Uh, it appears that those 500 hours are gonna count as vested years. Uh, so that could change your vesting schedule if you use a six-year vesting schedule. Okay, well now we'll get into something that Drew already touched on, but I'm gonna just add a little bit uh, to it. Uh, Drew talked about the catch-up provisions in the plan for uh, that for individuals, and this is for individuals in your organization that make more than one hundred and forty-five thousand dollars a year. If they want to use the catch-up provision, so in the case of a four hundred one k plan, instead of deferring twenty-two five, they can defer up to thirty thousand. That additional seventy-five hundred has to go into a Roth. Uh, designation as opposed to a pre-tax designation. Uh, the, the problem with that is if you have a plan that does not allow Roth contributions, then there is no way for that 
to put money in a Roth account. Unfortunately, that also means that no one then would be allowed from a discriminatory standpoint to make catch-up contributions. So if you have a situation where people use catch-up deferrals in the retirement plan, uh, many times higher paid employees, owners, or whatever it might be, uh, you probably need to look at, if you don't have a Roth provision, adding a Roth provision from your plan, because by not having one, you will not only prevent the higher paid people from catching up and putting money in Roth, which will be required, but you will stop any other employees from being able to use the catch up provision also. John, quick question. Yeah. I know this is effective 1124. Can they amend that plan now with you? They can. They can. And any of these things can be done now to avoid uh, last minute issues. Uh, now, I'm going to the next schedule and then I'll, I'll be back here a little bit. And, and you also touched on this, but this is the ability of employees to direct uh, match our profit sharing contributions into a Roth account. Uh, same issue here. You, obviously, you've got to be set up to handle Roths, uh, and then it can go into the Roth account. The thing that no one ever seems to talk about here is let's, let's think about what happens with this. Okay, Mr. Smith, Ms. Jones want to use the Roth for their profit sharing or their match. Roth is post-tax money, not pre-tax money. Everything that's been going into those accounts prior to this is pre-tax, meaning that they'll pay tax on it when it comes out. Just like Roth deferrals as they go in, which are post-tax, someone's going to have to pay tax on these profit sharing and match amounts during the year that it happened. So Mr. Smith now says, oh yeah, I'm gonna give a $5,000 profit sharing contribution. I want that to go into my Roth account. Okay, now Mr. Smith is faced with who's gonna pay the tax or how is he gonna pay the tax on that $5,000? Okay, so again, Roth is post-tax, so someone has to pay the tax now. And obviously the employer is not going to pay the tax for Mr. Smith. So Mr. Smith is going to end up with a tax bill at the end of the year for $5,000 times his tax bracket, uh, and it's going to be somewhat of a shock. They haven't decided yet, uh, the IRS hasn't decided yet how that's going to be reported. Are we going to report that on a W-2 as taxable income with no withholding? Are we going to report it on a new revised 1099-R? If you would otherwise on a distribution. So that part of the regulations hasn't been decided yet. The farms haven't been decided. The crazy part of that was it went into effect and it was available as of 12 29 22. We have had numerous clients call and say, hey, we'd like to use that Roth provision in there. Uh, and the first question is, have you thought about the withholdings? Somehow you got to get money from the individual, either at tax time and the IRS has it said. Can you just wait until you file your tax return and pay it? Or do we have to come up with that money on the front end? So um, be careful of that little trap there. There are some, some issues there as to how that type of money is going to be. The starter 401k is really not that uh, significant of a, uh, an issue. What that is saying is, is that for small new employers, uh, if you don't want to do a full-blown 401k plan today, you have the option of using a simple IRA or simple 401k. Uh, but unfortunately, the simple plan uh, did require employer money. Now they put this new starter 401k into being so that if you look down the list there, uh, it, it is a regular 401k. It does have deferrals, but the deferrals are limited at least on the initial year of $6,000, and there is no employer contribution being made. So basically it's a deferral only plan that allows you, it does not have discriminatory, discriminatory testing, uh, or top heavy testing. Uh, so you can put this plan into place, an owner could put in 6,000, um, and regardless of what the employees do, it, it wouldn't be tested for discrimination. You wouldn't have to create a safe harbor so scenario like we do today in either the simple or in a safe harbor 401k plan. So it's just a uh, kind of a smaller plan for 
uh, I guess new businesses. This one kind of uh, kind of makes you wonder because you've got an IRA limit of 6,500. Uh, it's not quite sure yet whether this new smaller plan is going to track with the IRA limits, and if so, then why am I doing this? What what is this for? But remember, today, at, with this plan being in place, we have 401k plans which allow $22,500 in deferrals, $7,500 catch up or $30,000 a year in deferrals. We have simple 401ks or simple IRAs, which allow uh, 13,5 plus 3,500 or 17 or 18,000 in deferrals. So they're like the second tier, but you've got employer money. Then you've got SEFs where you could do the same thing with, and now you have a new third level, fourth level of a plan of a starter plan, which would kind of be the infancy stages. There isn't anything written on this, how you would convert this yet to a regular 401k as the business grew. Uh, like Drew mentioned, with the simple four, simple IRA now, you were able to convert that to a 401k plan during the year, which is uh, very, very, really, very nice for businesses because prior to this, a simple 401k plan couldn't be rolled over until it had been in place two years and it could only be, you could only have one plan in place at a time. And so that was a problem. So this, this conversion topic was, was uh, worthwhile for many people. But this new plan uh, kind of makes you wonder what they were trying to accomplish here. Uh, it really is nothing more than having an IRA um, at that point in time. Uh, there are no filing provisions. You don't file 5500s or anything like that. So I, I guess it's a cheap way to put a, a decent plan in place. And the last thing I think I have is I want to go back a little bit to this and, and Drew mentioned that the student loan matching. Uh, this is kind of an interesting concept and uh, without getting into a lot of the details, what, what the the logic behind this was, was that, well, we have a lot of young employees on our staff and we have a 401k plan, but they're saying they can't afford to participate uh, because they have too much in student loan debt. Uh, and so because of that, they're not able to take uh, advantage of employer matches. Okay, so they can't get an employer match because you got to contribute to get an employer match, and I'm pouring all my money trying to pay down my student loan. So what this provision is is uh, allowing the if, if if it's an optional provision for a plan, but allowing the employer to adopt the the provision that says, okay, well if you're making student loan debt payments, I'll consider them to be salary deferrals, and then I'll match them also as as we do with the normal salary deferral. Unique concept. Uh, a lot of people think this is going to be a big deal uh, from an employer standpoint. Not sure this is really, I mean, how are you going to verify how much do you know their debt is? And the other question that has come up is okay, uh, I have $30,000 in student loan debt, and this year I paid down $5,000 of that. Well, was that for tuition? Was that for room and board? Are you going to match for someone's room and board that they paid in college? Uh, so there's still some real questions of whether or not that is going to to take and, and, and be successful, but there's been a lot of talk about it. So, I think that's all the major points I have. Uh, one, one last thing, we had solo 401k plans. A solo 401k plan is if you have an owner who either he or he and his spouse uh, have a retirement plan, they wanna use a solo 401k plan to take advantage of the high deferral limits. Uh, prior to this legislation, that plan had to be in place by the end of the year for you to be able to contribute to it. Uh, the, this law has changed it saying, no, we're gonna handle that like an IRA. You've now got until the filing of your tax return uh, prior to extensions if you wanna set up a sole 401k plan. So basically that would allow you, instead of putting $6,500 if you're over the age of 50 or 7,500 into it, an IRA, it would allow you to put away 30,000 based on your income. Uh, so, uh, we'll, we'll see if that has an effect. That is kind of a, a nice fee, but it, it applies to a very small group of individuals. John, thank you. And we have another slide that has all of their contact information. If you don't mind just uh, progressing uh, to the end. There we go. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to contact Don, you, and Drew for cutting edge planning. You can just tell uh, they're keeping up on the latest and the greatest opportunities in each of their fields. 
We also have an advanced planning department here at the bank. And uh, I'm vice president of the advanced planning department as a CFP. We sit down with you to listen to your objectives, your strategies and goals, all encompassing uh, for all your future needs, as well as business owners uh, in succession planning and key employee retention concepts. So I look forward to meeting with you also. Special thanks, I want to give a special thanks, first of all, to Brian Brewer, Senior Vice President of Financial Services here, that he had the vision of the Advanced Planning Department, and he's really uh, helping it grow. And secondly, for today's session, we couldn't have done it without Ashlyn Beasley and McAllister Stash right here. We want to give them a round of applause. Everything that went into planning for months and the technology and invitations, marketing and all, thank you. Appreciate it. And thank each of you for your attentiveness. And we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future. We'll be here for if you want to try out the capital a bit. Thank you.